Good afternoon. Um, I think most of you know I'm Lori Haas, one of the pastors here at Church of the Palms, and we are delighted that you have joined us for another lecture series. Um, I'm going to open us in prayer, make just a couple of announcements, and then I'm going to introduce Jamie. So let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we are grateful for this gorgeous day. We are grateful for the ways that you call us together so that we might learn and grow and live even more fully into who you call us to be. So we ask that you bless this time together in Christ's name. Amen. So a couple of announcements. Um, who here knows that we have a resource room up on the second floor of the education building? Great. So just so you know, that is available for you as a respite, as information. It is open and volunteer staffed on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Um, these times are on our website, but like Tuesdays 9 to 12, Wednesdays 10 to 1, Thursdays 12 to 3. It is a beautiful center, and it really is designed for anyone that feels like they need some special care, perhaps some information, but just know that we are here for you, and that is there. Um, next month, our next lecture series, and it was on this sheet of paper. I know you got a lot of things when you came in. It'll be in the bulletin again on Sunday, but on March 22nd at 3.30, and we might be moving to the sanctuary. We'll let you know for that on a talk called Medicine Mayhem, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, and it talks about proper medication management being one of the most essential parts of staying well. So we hear that this doctor is extremely um, well-spoken, popular, and we expect to have a ton of people at that, so we'll, hopefully you'll put that on your calendar as well. So we learned about Jamie Jamie Worley, when uh, we saw a newsletter that she put out for caregivers of those living with life-altering illnesses. And I know Pat got right on that again. She's like, this could be someone that would be so great for us in our ministry. So Jamie Worley is an elder law attorney in the Man oh, Manatee, Sarasota area. Elder law, as you probably know, is a subspecialty of estate planning which means that she takes a more holistic approach to help clients plan for retirement, health, and long-term care, Medicaid, and of course, what you think of whenever you think of estate planning. In addition to elder law, she is also a Veterans Affair accredited representative, and she represents veterans and their families in, pursuit, in pursuing benefits that would be available for them. So grateful for your work with that. Um, Jamie lives in Bradenton with her husband and two dogs, and I understand a mother that she inherited. Well done, congratulations. Um, unfortunately, when her dad passed in 2017. And then the one last thing, I love this. It is also safe to say that she's the only elder law attorney with a motorcycle race team. We want to hear more about that. Friends, would you help me welcome Jamie Worley? Thank you. Okay, can everybody hear me? Okay, very good. If at any point you can't, just raise your hand and I'll either call on you or talk louder, one of the two. So I am Jamie Worley. I am the attorney. So before we get started, I do not race the motorcycles. Actually, that is my office manager who is, is with me today and will be more than happy to talk to you about anything and everything related to that. The idea behind today is to kind of give you an introduction to some of the legal aspects of, of caregiving and what goes into that. This is a very kind of, I don't want to say basic, but entry level. We're going to talk about a, several different things. Most of things I'm sure you've heard something about. I'm hoping you've learned something new by the end of it. If you haven't, let me know and I will dig something new up for you, okay? So today we're gonna to talk about five and a half legal documents for caregivers, excuse me, some of the to-dos for caregivers and long-term care with Medicare versus Medicaid. One of the things before we get too far into this, and I don't wanna hold up because I have my answers written. In your folder, there's a happy little takeaway. I remember growing up in church that some of the pastors would do that, and I went, hey, I paid more attention when I had to fill one of those out. 
No one's checking your answers. You do not have to fill one out. Feel free to flip it over, use it as scratch paper, and completely ignore me. It's okay. That is not the end of my world. So, at least A has been answered at this point. So let's jump right into the five and a half documents to be aware of. Revocable trust, anybody in here not heard of a revocable trust? Okay, so everybody's familiar with that. I'm sure everybody's familiar with the last will and testament. Brilliant. So those are documents that address stuff. And, and that is important, but we're gonna focus more on the person more so than the stuff today. So the next are the durable power of attorney, designation of healthcare surrogate. This is also known as a power of attorney over healthcare, living will, and then the DNR or do not resuscitate order. And we'll kind of go through those each on their own. Trusts, as I said, they're the ability to control your estate. The advantage to trusts are they can help while you are alive but may be unable to manage your affairs and they continue after you pass. We utilize these not based on a size of an estate. We do it based on what your wishes are. If you say, listen, I want everybody to get it out right. I've got two kids and I don't care. You may not need a trust, to be honest with you. If you've got 17 beneficiaries, and you want to avoid probate, we're probably going to have to set up a trust. I say that because we've actually done that before. So this can be designed to protect your assets, to protect your, your family members, to protect your pets. Here in Florida, we can do pet trusts. Who in here has pets? You love your pets, right? Yeah. So you always got to think about that. We also include guardianship information for the pets in our documents, just in case something happens to you that somebody knows who's going to take care of them. Last will and testament, legal document, states how your property should be distributed after your death. This is a document that, while valid during life, has no authority. It has no power until you've passed away. So you can change it every day if you want to. I don't recommend that. It's a lot of dead trees. But you can, as long as you have the capacity to understand. The minute you pass away, that, that is valid and, and goes into action. An important aspect is the directions in your um, your last will and testament override the default inheritance provisions in Florida. So in the event you were to pass away without a trust, without a, a last will and testament in Florida, it's called intestacy. Just means you died without a will. And statute says, here is how your stuff will go. Again, it's stuff. My understanding is you'll be gone, so you won't care. I haven't done it, so I can't, bear, I can't vouch for that. But, you know, it may not be what your wishes are. You know, if you want to leave it all to the cat down the street, that is not how the state will have that set up. Any assets that are jointly owned have beneficiary designations, so like a bank account, um, retirement accounts, things of that nature where you set up designated beneficiaries. Doesn't matter what your will says, it's gonna go based on what those designations say. Now, the one aspect, and we hear this quite a lot, is well, I have a will so I don't have to deal with probate. Unfortunately, that's not necessarily true. So, Having a, a will says, this is what I want to have happen. Who you're actually saying that to is potentially the judge. And that's the whole concept behind probate. It is to prove your wishes. So any titled asset, we go back to bank accounts and um, retirement accounts, real estate, vehicles, anything of that nature, anything that's got a title, unless you have a designation set up or some other way for it to pass, that's going to require probate to open and to move that title from what was yours to the people or entities you wish to get it. And so in, here we note that probatum is the Latin root of it. It's a thing proved. Durable power of attorney. How many in here have a durable power of attorney? Very good. How many of you have a durable power of attorney since 2011? Yes, you, you've, you signed one after 2011. Okay. And the reason that I asked that question, and I, I realize you're probably like, I don't know when I signed it. Fair enough. The reason I ask is because in Florida, the laws changed in 2011. What we used to be able to do was a one, one and a half page document that said, they can do anything they want. It's all good. Legislature and everybody said, that's, that's a little too willy nilly, quite frankly. This is a powerful document. This controls your legal and financial affairs. 
It's supposed to be for your benefit, but that's still a powerful document. We want to make sure that people understand what it is they're doing. So when Florida adopted the, um, uh, I shall warn you every so often my brain stops functioning, the Uniform Power of Attorney Act, we got what we know as the superpowers. These are enumerated powers. So if you've signed a Florida power of attorney since 2011, there should have been a whole section where you had to initial each individual power. The reason for that, and bless them, the state thought if we make people go through an initial, that means they've read it. <laughs> oh, it's a beautiful idea, isn't it? Um, as a lawyer, I can tell you that is not the case at all. But, and I get what they were trying to do. It's to protect people, because these are the powers to do things like change beneficiaries on your bank accounts, create trusts, pull money from, add money to your trusts. These are things you want to think about whether or not you want to give people the power to do. You can limit that. It doesn't mean that just because that power is available that you want to give it to somebody. So when we went through that, a lot of the language started to become very vital. We'll talk about Medicare and Medicaid in a little bit, but specifically regarding Medicaid, if there are not certain clauses and certain language within the power of attorney, there is a chance that they will tell whoever's applying for someone else, you don't have the authority to do that. And then we get into a big argument with Medicaid and life gets really, really fascinating. But one of the key aspects of the power of attorney, as if anybody who's following along, is the power of attorney takes effect immediately in Florida once you sign it. It does not wait for you to become incapacitated. Likewise, as a durable power of attorney, it continues even if you are incapacitated. Okay, so maybe you're wondering, well, why would that be the case? It's a fair question. You know, why not wait until I'm incapacitated and I can't manage my affairs? Two reasons. One, you have to be declared incapacitated in those situations. That's a lengthy process. That can involve the courts. It can backlog the courts. What happens if people disagree? So the courts went, no, that, we've got to downplay that one. So that's why it takes effect immediately, is it eliminates the need to go through and potentially draw out making payments or signing contracts or doing anything of that nature. The flip side, and the way I like to look at it, is a little bit more positive. So you are on the European vacation of your dreams. And this little house down the street from you comes up for sale, and you go, I've always wanted that house, but I'm over here and it's over there. You can call your power of attorney. You have full capacity. You're good. There's nothing wrong. And say, hey, I need you to go over there, and I need you to make an offer. And as my power of attorney, you can sign those contracts for me. So you get to go and enjoy your vacation and still come back to the new little house down the street. So there is some you know, niceness about it. What we tend to counsel our clients who maybe aren't comfortable giving that kind of power to someone, and that's understandable, is don't give them a copy yet. And that's something that you know, each person is going to be different. You know, we've got some people that literally, when we do the signing, afterwards they bring the whole family in and go, OK, here, here's your copies. Everybody take them home. Cool. At that point, they can do whatever they want. We have others that just go, nope, here's the attorney's card. If something happens to me, call her. We do not answer the phone at 2 in the morning, just so we're clear. <laughs> did you have a question? Yeah, did you want to take questions now? Sure. Uh, so what happens if the person who has durable power attorney does, doesn't agree with the, their, the other person, but it's in their best interest to execute what they want to have done? The short answer is it depends upon exactly what the problem is. So if it's a situation like signing a contract as far as um, going into a, an assisted living facility, something of that nature, it just has to be weighed very carefully. At the end of the day, the agent, which is the person who is appointed under a power of attorney, they've got to have a clear mind and be able to say, listen, this is, I did this for legitimate reason. Flip side of that is someone who is behaving not nicely. That's actually a crime. And so if somebody were to have the power of attorney and start taking money, or I always use the example, go out and buy a power boat, it's not usually in somebody's best interest, then we have a problem. And we will advise its, its exploitation, its, its issues. Does that answer? Uh, the person wants the person that has power of attorney to do something, and that person doesn't think it might be a good thing to do, so they disagree. So then what do you do? It's the person who's wanting the power of attorney to act, the one who gave them the power of attorney. Yeah. 
if they have capacity, they can do whatever they want okay. at the end of the day. So the power of attorney doesn't override you, and that's, that's an excellent point. As, as long as, and we'll talk about that in a little bit as well, as capacity, but as long as the person, the principal, that's the one who signs the power of attorney granting the authority to someone else, as long as they have capacity, they control everything. It, it's still theirs. Just because you've signed this over doesn't push you to the wayside. That, that's actually the whole purpose behind having these documents is so that that doesn't happen. And we may get a little bit more into what you're talking about a little bit later. If not, feel free to, to come talk to me afterwards. So, power of attorney, legal and financial affairs. Designation of healthcare surrogate. This is medical issues. Not to be confused with a living will. A healthcare surrogate is more along the lines of you stub your toe and, and on the way to the hospital you knock yourself unconscious. They wheel you into the hospital. The doctor's gonna look at your healthcare surrogate and say, you know, we, we need to operate. Hopefully your healthcare surrogate knows what your wishes are and would either say, yeah, go ahead, operate, that's fine, or nope, they would not want that, no, no operation. You're gonna wake up, you're gonna be able to tell them what you want, but at the moment that decision had to be made, you couldn't tell them. That's what a healthcare surrogate does. It comes in and steps in as far as, as treatment, and this is where we'll see a lot of, of back and forth. Again, though, just because you've named someone in this role and just because someone's acting in this role, does not mean that they override your wishes. We tell people, as long as you can so much as blink your responses and have an idea of what's going on, what you say controls, and that's, that's true. Typically, the, whoever you nominate in your healthcare surrogate is the one that makes sure that your wishes in your, your living will are followed. And we'll talk about that next. The living will, this is the document that I think we all tend to think about as plug or unplug, food, no food. Um, four years ago, we didn't include mechanical breathing, but now that's being included as well. This is what outlines your wishes for what you want the doctors to do if you are incapacitated and terminal. This is not a you stubbed your toe and you're going to be fine in a couple of days. This is here, here we are, what's going to happen. These documents should be very personal. I mean, these, these should reflect your wishes. There are statutory forms that just say, yep, do this, do this, don't do that, don't do that, done. They're valid, absolutely, but these are the documents where you, know, you have the opportunity to talk about, I want my religious you know, minister to come and counsel, I want my family here, I don't want my family here, I want. We have had some that as long as the brain stem is alive, they wanna be kept alive. We've had others that have requested um, uh, to be ended. I have explained to them we don't do that here, so that's, that's not on the list. But it's an opportunity for you to step and say, this is what I want. It's the chance for you to say it now because if and when it happens, your loved ones are gonna be the ones making that decision. And so we really talk to people about what their wishes are in this because anybody in this room who's had to make that decision, and I'm right there with you, you almost get haunted for the rest of your life. Did I do too much? Or did I not do enough? Should I have fought harder? Should I have not put them through this? And so the idea behind the living will is if you tell them, this is what I want, this is what I don't want, it's not gonna eliminate it completely, but it helps reduce that should I have, because they're following your wishes. How many in here are familiar with Terry Schiavo? Okay. Um, Unfortunately, the, the number of hands I see with that question is getting fewer and fewer these days. So real quick for those who, who maybe not, aren't as familiar, Terry Schiavo was a 26-year-old woman here in Florida. And let's be honest, everybody remembers 26, right? I mean, I was there just, what, three years ago? <laughs> um, and plus tax. <clears throat> but 26, nothing bad is going to happen to you. They don't have these documents. They're not thinking about a living will because they're going to live forever. And unfortunately, she had a, a massive coronary event and did not die. She went in to life support, and her husband at the time said, listen, at the point that we all kind of determined she's not going to wake up, he said she wouldn't want to live like this. Understandably, her parents thought otherwise. Terry did not have a living will. She didn't have a health care surrogate. She had nothing. And it started a 14-year-long legal battle between her husband and her parents 
went to the Supreme Court. The governor of the state of Florida got involved. People were bussed in for, for protests, both for and against. And at the end of the day, she, she was able to pass, and they determined that there was no hope, after an autopsy was done, of her ever returning to an, a reasonable level of, of care. That's why these documents are important, because you are the only ones, and, and this goes even for married couples. I realize husbands and wives talk, but you know, at the end of the day, if your spouse had to make that decision, would they really know exactly what you want? Number of times I'll ask a couple in, in a session, okay, you know, do you want to be, have you thought about, do you want to be buried or cremated? And they both give a different answer and then look at the other one like, how did you come up with that? <laughs> okay. I, counseling sessions down the hall. So in that sense, that's what the living will does. And it, it needs to be considered and it needs to be drafted carefully. The other aspect to all of the documents that I just spoke about, they are living documents. While you're alive, your thoughts, your opinions, your ideas are gonna change. We've got medical treatments that none of us have even thought of that are on the horizon. So where you, you may say right now, you don't want anything done if this, this, and this happens. Five years from now, a new treatment could come up and you go, hey, wait, that changes things. At that point, you update your documents. This isn't a set it and forget it kind of thing. We've seen, I think the oldest will we had was 47 years. And I, of course, looked at the family and said, the people named here, where, where are they? They're all dead. Okay, cool. So, no personal rep. And all jokes aside, we just proceed as if there is no will because at that stage, there might as well not be. So I, I mentioned that the living will is, is separate. The living will talks about broad medical treatments of any kind. Compare that with what some of you may know as the DNR or the do not resuscitate. And this yellow, and I'm, I'm sorry for the, the quality, of, didn't blow up very well. This color sheet though, that's about the color it has to be printed on. DNRs are actually a medical order. You do not get them from attorneys. You get them from your doctor. Your doctor signs it, you sign it. Doctors and I do not chat about these things. We put in, you know, if that's your wishes, we can put into your living will, in the event this happens, I want a DNR, that's great. If you want a DNR, I would highly advise you speak to your personal care physician and get one set up. Because one of the things that has changed in Florida recently is, Excuse me. If you don't have one, and a guardianship has to be appointed for some reason, you don't have any of these documents, before your family or loved one can say, you know, we want this in place, they've got to go in front of the judge and argue that that's exactly what you would have wanted. That's expensive, it's heartbreaking, and it's very time consuming, because trust me, the courts are not like, I filed it today, I'll have it tomorrow. Trust me. I've got a few issues there, but that's a horse of a different color. This document deals specifically with refusal of cardiopulmonary resuscitation. I said it right. CPR. Unlike the living will, which like I said, it's a broad spectrum of things. It's if you go into kidney failure, this is what you want. If you have terminal cancer, this is what you want. DNR is literally just CPR issues. We have a lot of clients that come in and think they're the same thing or think that the DNR does a lot more than it does. Nope, unfortunately, they are two different documents meant to work together. So anybody that doesn't have one that wants one, and I'm not suggesting you go out and get one, just so we're clear, that's a personal choice. You have to talk to your doctor. So now we've kind of gone through, and so the, by the way, the DNR is the half. So when I said five and a half documents, you can't get that one from me, so we'll just call it the half. So, we now know what the documents are, we know what they do. Okay, I've, I've kind of convinced you that they seem a little important. Now we, we come to, well, but there's lots of free ones on the internet. There are, I've seen them, I've read them. Most of them have come in to me for probate. The problem with do-it-yourself is you have expectations and then you have reality. <laughs> you see a lovely cake online in a magazine, but there's often a difference between 
what you see and what you get, at least it does for me. If, if you can recreate this one, good job. And let me know afterwards, because I might have something for you to do. Similarly, and in case you can't tell, this is a man's knot for a tie. Very pretty, very intricate. Yeah. Now, this is, is fine. And these are lots of failed it's. <clears throat> these are fine for cakes, for your outfit, for super failed Christmas pictures. But at the end of the day, these pre-printed forms, mass-produced forms, they don't consider your personal needs. They don't consider what your goals are and making sure that that is properly explained and expressed. They're not meant for you. They're meant for you. So my documents would look the exact same as your documents, the same as their documents, the same as the kids down the street. Just out of curiosity, do you think we all have the same lives and wishes? I'm pretty sure the answer is no. I could be wrong. So in this sense, what we tend to see with do-it-yourself documents is obviously misunderstanding of the law. Because if a document's drafted for the whole country, how specific can it be? We had a client call right before we left to come here, a potential client, that we don't know where they found the document, I'm guessing online, but they had a power of attorney that was signed 10 days ago and are having problems with it. Yeah, it doesn't meet the statutory requirements for Florida. That's problem number one. There are several other problems I won't bore you with, but the problem that you run into is by thinking, well, I'll just do this quick and easy. It will be for you. It won't be for your family. It won't be for the people who are having to deal with it, even if that's not family, if, if it's friends. I have had more people through probate come to me and go, you know, they were my best friend in life. I hate them now. And uh, some of them have valid reasons, just so we're clear. But these are things, it, probably one of my favorite sayings, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And that's where we are at this point. To do for caregivers, this is not all encompassing. There's a, a lot for caregivers. How many of you serve as caregivers? So I don't have to tell you, there's a lot more to it than this. Um, but I did want to kind of plant some ideas into your mind of things maybe you haven't thought of yet. Things like understanding decisional capacity. Capacity is not black and white. It is not all or nothing. We've heard of, everybody's heard of sundowners. Yeah, in the morning, they're great. Everything's wonderful. 5.30, somebody meeting them for the first time would say, that person doesn't have capacity. So understanding when they're trying to make decisions or trying to determine who should be making decisions, whether it's the agent under power of attorney or the healthcare surrogate, you've got to consider the person who the decisions are being made for and what their, their wishes are and whether or not they understand what's going on at that moment. That does not mean, I am not saying, that just because they are spry and ready to go in the morning that they should be able to go marry the 30-year-old you know, that found them online and has convinced them to send millions of dollars to them. That is not what I am saying. I am just saying that this is part of being the caregiver is taking, taking your, your person's wishes into mind and how to make sure that they stay as independent as possible. Next one is a big one. <clears throat> know what legal authority you have. Anybody that has, that is named in these documents, so is named as an agent, is named as a healthcare surrogate, read the documents if they've given them to you. Read them back and forth, upside down, everything. Read them repeatedly. Because that's going to tell you what your rights and, and abilities are. That's what's going to tell the bank or the doctor or the whoever it is you're presenting it to what your rights are. We will have people occasionally call from a, a bank and say, they're saying I don't have the right to, to access this account. Okay. Banks don't like lawyers. <clears throat> I don't think anybody likes lawyers. In all fairness, <laughs> I don't blame them. And, and, and on a side note, does anybody know how many lawyer jokes there are? <laughs> Just one. The rest are true stories. <laughs> so, And I can say that because I am a lawyer. So the, the people get up at it, yeah. But you no, know, in that sense, They'll put me on speakerphone, and I'll say, well, if you turn to page blah, blah, blah of the power of attorney, you will see under point 3.17 that they do, in fact, have the right to this. And if you then turn to page you know, 15 and look at this one, da, 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 they have the right to the digital. Oh, and if you turn to Article 7, that is the statutory teeth 
that say, if you do not follow what you are supposed to do within the prescribed time frame, I get to sue you. And it wouldn't be the first time I've brought charges against a bank for not doing what they were supposed to. I don't look forward to that. I am not a suing lawyer. My job is to keep you out of court. That is my goal. But sometimes you got to do what you got to do. Have documents in place with backups named. So what I mean by this is not just your, the person you're caring for, making sure that they have documents. Making sure you have your own documents. You know, the number of times, and again, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but caregivers, what do you tend to do? You tend to care and put your own health aside. You don't take care of yourself. You don't make sure that the documents are in place. It's, I get it. I, I totally get it. So pot, kettle, very nice to meet you. But you do have to make sure that it's all taken care of. What I mean by backups named, <clears throat> a lot of people will have documents where they name their husband as their agent. Makes perfect sense. What happens if something happens to both of them, though? Then it's as if no one has been named. So we recommend at least one backup for every primary person that you have named, preferably somebody that doesn't ride in the car with you all the time. Not that I'm putting that out into the universe. Everybody here is going to live a long, happy, healthy life. We're not killing anybody off today, just so we're clear. But making sure you've got these backups named because you can have the best documents in the world, and if at the end of the day, no one in them can serve, you don't have them. So that leads us to what we'll talk about in just a moment. Managing Social Security and veterans benefits. Has anybody here applied to be a representative payee for Social Security for anybody? No, you all seem too happy. Um, <laughs> no, I say that. It, it's, it's Social Security, so you're on hold for at least two hours. This is a basically a role where you have the ability on behalf of someone else who's receiving Social Security or VA benefits, and VA handles theirs, Social Security handles theirs, to say, we need to open this account, we need to close this account, we need to have the money transferred, we need to do different things. A power of attorney from any state, Social Security, VA will laugh at and go, that's lovely a waste of paper. We don't care. And they have the right to do that because they are federal agencies. So our little state rules don't apply to them. They use it as a sense of, OK, we see who they would want to be in charge. But you still have to go through their process. If you are working with someone who maybe has capacity now, but you see on the horizon that something might be coming up, the time to work on those things is when someone can, not after they can't, quite frankly, because they can nominate them ahead of time. It's not a problem. The next one we are just very, very briefly touching on. Know the signs of abuse, neglect, and exploitation. You guys, as caregivers, are the front line of what's going on. And unfortunately, my office manager and I were talking about that this afternoon. Every facility we drive past has a sign, uh, now hiring. The people that I've talked to who are in different facilities are saying, yeah, the staff is half of what it used to be. The fear that I have is, in the state of Florida, they have to pass a level two background check, anybody that works there. I mean, there's all these requirements. They don't just take a breathing body. But if they get desperate enough, I don't know what's going to happen. And for anybody who reads the news, the number of cases of exploitation, of fraud, of duress, is increasing. And that terrifies me. Because what that means is somebody somewhere didn't catch it. It could be the bank. It could be family. It could be the caregiver. It could be that nobody's checking on these people. As sad as that is to say, sometimes there's only one left. But that is something that we're seeing more and more of, especially as people are getting more desperate in situations. Florida has very strict exploitation laws, and we take them very seriously. So if at any point you question what somebody's doing, let an elder law attorney know. We do not, we do not criminally charge the exploitation, but I do work with attorneys who do. We are more than happy to pass those out. So we've talked about the documents you need, we've talked about maybe do-it-yourself isn't the best option for that. What happens if you either don't or you have do-it-yourself that go wrong? The only option is guardianship. Guardianship is a court-overseen process by which, once you are determined to be incapacitated, your rights are stripped from you. Period. Full stop. 
stripped. I don't mean, hey, you're going to be fine in a week. We're going to give them right back to you. No, it's a process to get them back. So guardianship should absolutely be the last resort. It is. We have no other choice. And we've had to do that in some cases, unfortunately. Every aspect, understandably, is supposed to be overseen. We're, we've got a guardianship we're doing the annual reporting on now. They have to send me the bank account statements for the entire year that I have to submit to the court. And I have to be able to account for every single penny in and out. If it's off anywhere, I get yelled at by the clerk of court. I'm a lawyer. The running joke is we go to law school because we can't do math. <laughs> I can do math, but yeah. It, it gets a little hairy sometimes. This is very costly. You know, even for the people who don't have any money, it's costly. There are filing fees. There's fees to pay for the committee members who determine whether or not you have capacity. There's legal fees for the person who may not have capacity more. There's legal fees for the person who's petitioning to be the guardian. And that's if everybody gets along. If they don't, yeah, it can get very, very costly. And amazingly enough, I know this is going to shock everyone, but the more money someone has, the more people want to be guardian. Yeah, shocking, I know, I know. Humans are great. What happens with guardianship? This is where you can't make the decisions anymore. You have not appointed someone, or whoever you have appointed can't do it either. They've, they've passed away, they are also incapacitated, or they say no. Important fact that I forgot to put up on here, so I apologize. Just because you've nominated someone does not mean they have to do it. They can flat out be like, yeah, no, I'm out. And that's another reason we recommend backups. So in that sense, talk to your people. It, either if you've named them already or you're thinking about naming them, just say, hey, listen, what are your thoughts if I do this? Personal representative, which is the will, if they've ever served as personal representative of anybody's estate, will probably tell you no. Just warning you. But the others are a little bit different story. Guardianship is terrible, quite frankly. And we go back to that ounce of prevention, pound of cure. You can have the documents in place. You can go ahead now. And I realize this is not a fun thing to do on a Saturday afternoon. Hey, if I become incapacitated, what do I want? If I were to die, how do I want my, my funeral to go? These are not fun thoughts. They're not. But you can make them now and have peace of mind that, listen, I have, I have told them what I want. Or you can just blindly go through life and hope and pray that they get it right. Choice is yours. So let's talk a little bit, <clears throat> excuse me, I knew I would dry out. Let's talk a little bit about long-term care and what the options are there. Everybody knows Medicare and Medicaid. Medicare is, wrong slide, sorry. Medicare is the federal health insurer, 65 and over. There are caveats to all of this. So if somebody's on disability, they may get it too. I'm just kind of glossing over that aspect, okay? So there's always more details to anything in the law than, than what's being presented. Medicaid, however, is a joint federal and state. What this means is that each state makes their own rules. <laughs> That's so much fun. Um, I'm slightly sarcastic in case somebody didn't warn you. I apologize. That's just who I am. Um, Medicare has set standards. So as long as you're within the network, that's that. Medicaid does not. Medicare, much like insurance, you pay a copay, all of that. Medicaid, typically when it covers, covers just about everything. Medicaid is considered to be one of the most complex laws in the United States. Further complicating, as I said, each state has a different version of Medicaid. Why this matters and, and why you should, should even give thought to any of this is as of 2018, as 2018 study, the average cost of a Florida skilled nursing facility, this is what we think of when we think nursing home, we call them skilled nursing. Sounds a little bit nicer, I guess. Was over $110,000. So unless the person you're caring for or yourself has that kind of money, cool, good, good job living life, you gotta pay for it somehow. So that's where Medicaid may come in. Hopefully, nobody here ever needs it. Hopefully, nobody you're caring for ever needs it. You live long, happy, healthy lives. You go to sleep one day, and that's that. That's my hope for everyone. Unfortunately, doing what I do, there's a reality. So Florida Medicaid, because we're in Florida. Is anybody here not a resident of Florida? OK. 
So for those of you not residents of Florida, just ignore this part. <laughs> Florida Medicaid is overseen by the Department of Children and Families. Prior to COVID, they had entire units that were devoted to what we call institutional care. That's the skilled nursing and all of those. COVID hit, Florida had 1.8 million applications for food stamps that it had never had before. So DCF went, all of you, come over here, do that now. So things got behind. Things are still slightly behind. We're only, what, three years past now? But they're, they're working through it. So this is a huge statewide department that oversees a number of different aspects, obviously. We have a variety of programs for adults. The institutional care program, like I said, that is the, the one we typically think of with nursing homes. There's the SMMC LTC, State Managed Medicaid, something, long-term care. This is a program that Medicaid kicks in a, a, an aspect, but instead of having to go into a nursing home, someone could stay at home. The idea is if we can prolong before they need to go to the nursing home, which is gonna cost so much more money, maybe we could keep them at home if we gave them some occupational therapy and some respite care, things of that nature. It is a fantastic program that is horribly underfunded, for lack of a better phrase. That is available in our area. PACE program, I'm not gonna talk about much, but depending upon what county you're in in Florida, is available. Manatee, Sarasota counties, it is not. So, yeah, I know. I don't have anything to do with that. But there are different programs, so just know that. If you talk to someone and say, well, are you getting Medicaid? The answer could be yes, and what they've got and what they're applying for is radically different than anything anybody else would be worrying about. In Florida, there's a three-pronged test. That is the truth in most states. There's the medical test. That is one we have nothing to do with. This is where an assessment team comes in and says, the person who might need a nursing home or long-term care at the house must meet this threshold level. They must need continuous care. If the person doesn't have that medical need, we don't care about the rest because they don't qualify. But let's say that everything's fine medically, they've got the medical, medical requirement. Then we look at the income limits. In the state of Florida, it's a little over $2,300 a month. Now, if you make more than that with Social Security, pension, 401k, any of that, you may be going, oh no, well, I could never get Medicaid. That's not necessarily true. Because let's say that $10,000 a month, because that's just a nice round number and I like this. $10,000 a month, if you're getting $5,000 a month, great, you're over the threshold. But that $5,000 isn't gonna cover $10,000. Medicaid recognizes this and says, oh, okay, okay, we'll, we'll give you some tools to work with. And that's why, that's one of the reasons why we recommend talking to someone who's versed in Medicaid to understand what options there are to, to keep that intact. Then we have asset limits. State of Florida, and we'll go over this in comparison, State of Florida's asset limit is $2,000. You cannot have assets worth more than $2,000. The interesting part there is though, there is countable and non-countable assets. So did I mention Medicaid's fun? Um, and it, once you get used to it, it, it makes sense and I can look at something and go, yep, 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 nope, 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 we're good. So there are lots of different aspects. Medicaid is not a you come in typically. You come in, you apply, you get on it, you're done. Usually we've got to do something, we've got to look at different aspects, we've got to answer things. So one of the questions on here, if we're now in Medicaid, Medicaid has a five-year look back. What does that mean? <laughs> Just out of curiosity, can anybody tell me what the $16.12 charge you had two years ago was for? <laughs> Probably not, yeah. So a five-year look back is literally, if you apply January 1st, 2023, five years prior to that, they want to know about things you gave away, money you spent, if you gifted anything, because Medicaid believes, and I mean this, this is written in their manual, <laughs> that whatever you did, unless you prove otherwise, was solely for the purpose of getting Medicaid. Five years in the future. So you gift your granddaughter money for her college graduation. Well, you explain that to Medicaid and that's okay, but they're going to assume, unless you do, that you did that solely so you could have Medicaid in a few years. Cool. They're also the payer of last resort, which is also in their manual. So you've got the five-year look back. You have to qualify. The problem with Medicaid in Florida is there's lots of misinformation. Google is a wonderful thing until it's not. Um, we occasionally will have clients that we've been seeing for years that the neighbors are wonderful people who will not call me for some reason. 
But every month or so, we'll see my client go, you know Medicaid's going to do blah, blah, blah. Nope, not in Florida, can't do that. I'll get a phone call every six weeks. Are, are you sure they can't? Yep, yep, I was on the committee, I know, they can't do it. But of course, the neighbor is convinced, probably because whatever state they came from, that state could do it. We have lots of potential penalties, so we'll go over this in just a moment, but let's say that you did sense you might need Medicaid, you gotta get that down to below the $2,000, so you're gonna give 10 grand to your, your loved one and just be like, hide that for me. Well, unless you can prove that there was something legitimate behind that, you're gonna get penalized. And what that means is you have to self-pay, and if you don't have the money, uh, it's not great. So this is an area that you, you really need to talk to people who know what they're, they're talking about long before things happen. The other issue, and just out of curiosity, who in here has heard of Medicaid estate recovery? Okay, what about Medicaid clawback? A uh, couple more. Yeah, so we go back to the, the layman's terms. So yes, Medicaid has the right to try and recoup the money that they spent. Each state has different rules. I don't know if I've said that six or seven times now. At the end, there will be a quiz. Medicaid estate recovery program in the state of Florida can only go after probate assets. So what that means is anything that you've got set up for beneficiary designation or set up to pass through a trust that's properly funded, we don't have time to get into that tonight, that's passing outside of probate. Medicaid can't, can't claim anything. If there is a probate estate, trust me, they can. And they want it. And they will not negotiate. And let me tell you how hard it is to sell breeding pigs. Not something I thought I'd have to do in law school, but that's cool. Just so we could make sure to try and get the money liquidated enough to pay Medicaid. It took us a year and a half, but we finally did it. So Medicaid estate recovery. I mentioned each state is different. I picked random states. They are in alphabetical order. I was not picking one over the other. California. I mentioned that Florida has a three-pronged test, medical income asset. California has no income limit. You can make $100,000 a month and potentially qualify. Good, bad, and different. Your assets have to be under $130,000. Again, that's countable versus non-countable, and what they consider countable versus not countable is different than what Florida considers countable and not countable. Yeah. You gotta love what you do. You have to have every state that I, I compared, you have to have a certain level of medical need. In California, you get a monthly allowance of $35. So what happens with Medicaid is the person who's receiving Medicaid gives their entire pay to the facility, but they get to keep something because there's stuff that comes up, you know, incidentals, et cetera. Medicaid makes up the difference. In California, it's $35. Do not ask me how they come up with these numbers. We do not know. California, there is no home value. Uh, there's no maximum on the home value. So your house could be worth $20 million. You could still potentially qualify for Medicaid. And it's, they don't call it Medicaid, but I'm not gonna bore you with those weird details. I'm a nerd, if you wanna talk about it later, feel free to come up and talk. They do have Medicaid estate recovery. In California, the home can be sold to repay the debt. Now, this is not true, just so we're clear. If the spouse is still living and living in the house, there's a few other caveats that if there's a child under the age of a certain number or if there's a disability, again, this is just high-level conversation, okay? Connecticut, income has to be under the cost of the nursing home. I don't know if they vary that based on which nursing home or if there's just a general. Your assets have to be under $1,600. Not sure where they came up with that one. Monthly allowance is $75. Home value maximum is a little over $1 million. Now, you will see in bold, expanded Medicaid recovery state. So Medicaid has the right to want their money back. That's, I mean, it's a state federal program. They're spending a lot of money. Money's not really going into them. They're not selling football tickets. So they have to get it back somehow. In expanded Medicaid states, it doesn't matter if there's a probate opened or not. They can potentially go after trusts, beneficiary designations, anything. Again, spouses are a different story. 
So if you've still got a, a living spouse or what we call a community spouse, these rules are not nearly as black and white. But in states designated as expanded, the Medicaid offices can go after assets not through probate. They can seek reimbursement via anything held by the survivor, well, arguably surviving spouse, life estates and assets in a living trust. They cannot kick a, live, a, a community spouse out of their home and make them homeless, anything of that nature. But if there's a joint bank account that isn't going to leave them destitute, they could potentially go after it. Florida, there's a reason we all come here. Income must be, I'm sorry, they raised it, 2742. Assets countable under 2000. Monthly allowance, $130 a month. That has not gone up in five years. Again, we have no idea why they picked this number. It hasn't, yeah. So we have a note here, the home value is 688,000 maximum. I will give them props. The housing market here is a wee bit insane right now, for anybody who's, who's noticed that. So Medicaid is not holding true to this. So they're basically, they're not saying, oh, well, your house shows is uh, worth 750,000 today, so we're kicking you off the program. They're, they're not doing that. If you've got a home that's worth five million, that's probably not just due to the market, just throwing that out there. So what they do is they basically say, nope, that, that excess, you gotta deal with it somehow. Florida is a Medicaid estate recovery. Again, the estate recovery means probate assets. And in Florida, it's probate assets only, only. The difference here, and so Connecticut, they can sell the home too. Homestead in Florida is protected. And that's on your cheat sheet. There's a reason it's on your cheat sheet. It is protected, they cannot sell it. They cannot put a lien on it, they cannot go after it. No creditor can except for ones related to the house. So if you have a mortgage, the mortgage still has to be paid. Don't go, I went and heard a lawyer, they said I don't have to pay my mortgage anymore. That is not the situation. All I'm saying is that if you or your spouse need a Medicaid or someone that, that's connected to you, Medicaid cannot come after the house, even if it has to go through probate. They smile and wave at it as it drives by them. And that's the extent of it. And this is one of the biggest issues that we run into with clients who move here from another state. Because wherever they came from, Medicaid could sell, this, could sell the house, and probably did for somebody they know, because this is ingrained in them. And are, are you sure? Are you positive? Yes, I do probate, trust me, I know. Yeah, they just wave. It is the most protected asset. Texas is the other state that has it very, very protected as well. So compare that to New York and Ohio, you can see the different income levels. Interestingly, Florida and Ohio have very similar limits, but Ohio is an expanded Medicaid recovery state where Florida is not. Almost every other state, they could potentially sell the house, that doesn't mean they will. And again, there's lots of caveats to, to this stuff. What I want you to know, if you take nothing else away today, although I do hope you take some of these answers with you, Medicaid can't take your homestead here, okay? I promise you, and if any of your neighbors say, that's not true, have them call me. Please, I will explain it to them. So when you talk about home value, it's home value, not your homestead. No, it is your homestead. They're basically, so if your homestead, the, the home that you live in is worth $750,000, then arguably it doesn't meet the requirements. But like I said, they're not paying attention to that within reason. Five million, six million dollars, yeah, they're gonna, they're gonna argue. We did have one, it wasn't me. If you own a home that's not a homestead, that's... Ah, excellent question. So if you own a second home, unless it's rental property, you're gonna have a problem. And that's even if it's in another state. And yes, if you pass and that goes through probate, a non-homestead property, that's why I said your homestead, your home cannot be taken. But if you've got vacation property, you've got, I've never seen them go after a timeshare. Amazingly, even Medicaid doesn't want that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I say that tongue in cheek for anybody that has a, a, a timeshare, I, I say that jokingly. But, but yes, technically. Now, that being said, and that's an excellent question. So is there anything you can do to prevent that? Oh yeah. Yeah, that's why you go and you talk to attorneys and you talk to people who deal in Medicaid and go, here's how we reassess your assets, here's how we protect things. The idea is not to take somebody who's worth millions and millions of dollars, squirrel that away and then be like, hey, 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 we're gonna have the government pay for you now. Usually what we're working with is an estate that's just too much to qualify, but not enough to really do anything. 
So we set up different tools so that there's money left to take care of what Medicaid doesn't, and it sets it aside. We focus on families where there is a, a community spouse and a, a skilled nursing spouse. Because again, we don't want all the money from the union going to the skilled nursing spouse because what's going to happen to the community spouse? Now they're destitute. Well, that doesn't solve anything. So we want to try and keep that balance. That said, there are people who are worth millions and millions of dollars who try and get around this stuff. And that's fine. That's their God-given right. I just haven't worked with them. And that's all I will say on that. So we're, we're finishing up, and, I, and then we'll get to any more questions. Myths and less than great ideas. This is by no means all of them. So I think we've gone over this, but if I or my spouse need Medicaid, Medicaid and or the facility can take our house and all our assets. Can Medicaid take the house? Yeah. Everybody gets a gold star. Homestead. Exactly, Homestead, correct. Yes, Homestead. The facility doesn't want your stuff. I got a news flash. They don't care as long as they're paid by somebody. They really don't care where it comes from. But the facility's never going to walk into your house and be like, hmm, we're going to have an estate sale. This should get you at least half a month's worth of stuff. That's not how that works. Medicaid is the one that's going to look at what your assets are worth. And that's what one of the things that we do is help people figure out how to rearrange that. I'm just going to give money to my family before I apply. Yeah, that's a terrible idea. Um, because we have the five-year look back. And trust me, they can find it. It's amazing. Medicaid can't do a whole lot, but they can find There was a woman, it was a, a colleague, not us. This little old lady had been on Medicaid for a couple of years, and all of a sudden Medicaid sent a letter to the family and said, we, her assets are over the limit. We're kicking her off the program. The family went, Dude, what, what now? Apparently she was one of eight siblings that inherited a fraction of an interest in property in like Puerto Rico. Family had no idea about this. I mean, they did not know she inherited it. They didn't know any of this. Medicaid did. How, I do not know. I have not figured that out. But I, I say that to say they can find stuff. People, people all the time think, I won't tell. They won't know. They will. They will. And here's the problem. If you intentionally keep it from them, thinking they'll never find it, that's fraud and it's punishable. Lots and lots of dollars and up to prison time. So don't try that one. It's different if you don't know about it. That, that's understandable. And for the record, the sweet lady did not lose her Medicaid. The family scrambled, got it all taken care of, and Medicaid said, okay, yeah, we agree with you. That's fine. But don't, don't try to hide things and think that it's just going to go away. Here's something that's come up lately. Um, NPR did a story about um, family members being financially responsible for their loved ones, meaning your children uh, suddenly having to pay for parents' care in another state. And the issue, of course, the story focused on an estranged child who hadn't talked to the parent in 30 years. OK, I get it. Florida does not have any filial responsibility laws. So what that means is your children are not responsible for you financially. Legally, they're not responsible for you at all. I'm sorry. Does anybody need a minute? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I, I see the good and the bad. But in that sense, in Florida, the spouses technically aren't either. You can tell Medicaid, I'm not paying for my spouse. There's upsides and downsides to that. We're not going to bother to get into because that's getting a little too in the weeds. But at no point can somebody go after your family and say, you are now responsible for this debt. Because that's, that's just not right. We'll go over, and, and so one caveat I'll, I'll note, I think this is the last one on your, your cheat sheet. When signing as the agent or surrogate, make sure you, if you're doing it or your loved one is doing it, that they sign as agent or healthcare surrogate. So what I mean by that is it would be um, Jane Smith by Sally Sunshine as agent or as surrogate. The reason for that is because then it's very crystal clear. That person is signing in their capacity as this nominated legal entity, not as Sally Sunshine, I'm just here, thank you. Because unfortunately, we have seen people who don't necessarily understand the contract, or it's written in a very convoluted way, and suddenly they are on the hook. It's not because something, it's not because they did something wrong or intended to, it's because they didn't necessarily understand what they were signing, and they signed as themselves. So that is the key, is to make sure that you sign as agent or, or surrogate, 
and make sure anybody else does as well. I've had estate documents for 20 years, no need to update. I sincerely hope that we went over this, but just in case we didn't. A lot can happen in 20 years. Who here moved here within the last 20 years? That's a couple of you, right? So are your out-of-state documents just as good as Florida documents? Ah, very excellent. So that's not necessarily correct, and I'll explain why. The rules are, as long as the documents that you had were executed properly in the state that you came from, they will be valid in Florida. That said, documents like your power of attorney, your healthcare surrogate, those are state specific. So while something from, I'm gonna pick on Ohio, if anybody's from Ohio, I'm sorry. If your documents from Ohio aren't written the same way that Florida's are, Florida bankers, Florida investors, they're used to seeing specific kind of documents, and they're used to seeing Florida Statute 723. If they start seeing weird codes for Ohio, they're gonna be like, I'm sending it to legal. Nobody knows who legal is at these banks, by the way. I'm a lawyer, we don't know. It can delay things. So we always recommend, if you are now a resident, update those documents. It's usually a good idea too anyway, unless you did it six months before you moved. That's usually a good time to be like, okay, who do you, do you still want these people serving? Oh no, they moved to Greece. Okay, yeah, we should probably pick someone a little closer. Last will and testament, trusts, all of those, as long as they were properly executed, they are valid. Caveats, trusts are a little bit easier depending upon what's going on with them, but with a will, as long as they also meet the requirements for Florida, it's a very smooth process. If they don't, that just means your attorney during probate is gonna have to do a lot more work. Trust me. So. Excellent response though, because that makes a very good point. I am a big fan of, of update your documents. I, I am, because like I said, these are living. You know, they should reflect your wishes and your wishes will change. But in that sense, it is not a matter of, okay, I just became a Florida resident. Before I even change over my driver's license, I've gotta go update my estate documents. No, not, not, not at all, just so we're clear. And if any other attorney tells you differently, you call me. There are some who will be scary. Oh, did you want to take a picture of that? Sorry. Did you get it? <laughs> All right. Well, I've talked a lot, and I apologize. No, I don't. Sorry. Um, I'm a lawyer. That's what we do. What questions? Yes, ma'am. Right, so it, it can depend. The, the short answer is if, if things, and we work with a lot of clients like this, where things are kind of imminent, we know this isn't just a temporary kind of situation. What we recommend at that point is that the caregiver update their documents to remove the person's name. The reason that I say that is not because we like to redraft documents. I love trees, I do. We try to use recycled paper, but it only goes so far. The reason for that is because it's very simple if you've got Joe Schmo named as your primary agent on a power of attorney and Joe Schmo dies. Cool, well not cool, but you can give him a death certificate to show this is why Joe Schmo isn't doing this anymore and the second person's doing it. When someone's losing capacity or is having some, some difficulties there, you don't always wanna carry around a letter from a doctor saying that. So for the caregiver at that point, depending upon how many people are named in the document as far as successive, it may be a good time to update and add a new person below. If we have a secondary person listed, mm -hmm. do we need to do anything? You don't need to, no. It just makes it easier and eventually you're gonna have to. So, but no, you're not required to at all. Does that answer? Okay. Any other questions? Evidently, one thing I learned, caregiver is a, is a, is a legal term? So it can be. Um, Caregiver is typically just anybody who, who cares for another for all intents and purposes. That doesn't, so just being a caregiver doesn't mean you're named in anybody's documents. It doesn't mean you have any legal authority. But usually when someone is a caregiver, hopefully for the person they're caring for, they have those documents in place to either work with someone or they themselves are the ones named. In the event of guardianship, which is a legally sanctioned 
caregiving role, for lack of a better phrase, then they are known as guardian and ward. So. So, so if you're a caregiver, okay, I guess I'm trying to understand the definition of a caregiver. I never really Think of it just a high level, realistically, is, is anyone who provides care for another. So the visiting angels, the place for mom, all those things that you see ads for on TV, those are caregivers. They don't have any legal right to necessarily do anything. They're just the person providing care. So that's kind of the point of this is to make sure, I am not saying, to be very clear, that you should be giving power of attorney to a visiting angel or someone coming in for those roles. Trust these people. But in that sense, they're caregivers. But that doesn't mean that they have any legal right. So you've got caregivers who just provide care and help deliver food and do different things. That's just a non-legal term. That's just a person. So if some legal issue comes up, it really isn't directly because they're a caregiver. It's because of the specifics of the issue. Correct. And it may be a situation that a caregiver, and, and I say that someone who's providing care for another, sees things that need to be reported. You know, like I said, with, with fraud and, and some of these other issues, exploitation, sometimes the person who's there is the one who's, who's most likely to see it. So at that point, they would get legal involved, but that doesn't mean that they have any responsibility beyond that. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. okay. Do they, at that point, then ask for surrogate, become a surrogate to me that I no longer, I mean, I come in, dementia, you come in and you go out. Right. Right. The short answer is, if you had them executed in Florida, no, it should be valid now. So they could come in and act on your behalf right now. They cannot trump you, though. Okay. So, you know, if, if the doctor says, we want you to try this, this, um, experimental medication and you go no and your kids go we think it's a good idea they can't override you and say doctor give it to her but they they should have the authority now that's one of the things Florida did was make everything immediate yep I promise you're not charged at all to ask questions so now's the time to do it <laughs> yeah yeah yes sir Social Security does not. Um, I'm sorry. The question was, when does Social Security get involved when you're taking care of someone who's receiving Social Security? So Social Security itself will not call the person and say, hey, we think there's a problem. Whoever is taking care of that person is going to have to call Social Security and say, hey, we have a problem. Usually it's not a, as long as there's no fraud, there's no um, criminal behavior going on in the bank account, it's not that big of a deal because it's still, Social Security, I'm sure everybody here knows that, is direct deposited. They will not mail you a check. So as long as there's nothing wrong with the account, you just let it keep going and everything is fine. We have unfortunately had cases where people fell victim to fraud or scams and we have to close that bank account quickly because they just keep siphoning. That's when it becomes a problem and we're on the phone with Social Security saying, we've got to get this representative payee nominated. So the best time, excuse me, to have a representative payee nominated is while you are alive and well. Because they have no authority until you can't do it. And they call and say, we're, we're doing this. And even then, they can't reroute it to their bank account. They can't reroute it to their family's bank account. It has to be one in the person's name or for the benefit of. Make sense? And why do they call that person when they're acting in the... Repre uh, Social Security calls them a representative payee. Representative payee. Yep. And that is their term. I see a hand back there. Yes, sir? Yeah, is there any kind of a, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security for dummies book out there? <laughs> <sighs> That's an excellent question. The, the short answer is yes, but which version do you want to read? Um, right, no, 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 I get it. The, the problem that you run into is everybody has different interpretations of it all. Um,
Okay, well the first answer is yes, it's available online. Does it make any sense? That's where we run into problems. So the amount of time it took to get that research done, I will not bore you with, but okay. I'm a nerd, so I enjoy it. Um, it, not necessarily. Now, Medicaid.gov, uh, Medicare.gov, trust the .gov sites, .coms, because there's a lot of misinformation. And so what you can usually do with one of those, and, and we've got links. I'll have to see if I've got any for Medicaid on our website. Because because I'm a nerd, I share the nerdiness, in case you couldn't tell by your folders. I share the nerdiness, so feel free to go on the website and check and see what we've got there. But there are links to different components that are legitimate um, websites and informational. But I, that's where I would start as far as, as understanding the difference. Social Security, there is no website where it makes sense. Not No worries, that happens to me mid-sentence, mid don't worry. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, you think about that and we'll jump. Yes, ma'am. Um, Can I call you two in the morning? <laughs> Leave a message. They both do. So each one serves a different role. So think of it as, as wearing different hats. So your agent under power of attorney wears a red hat, your healthcare surrogate wears a blue hat. I'm not picking that for political reasons, I just picked red and blue. Each one has, has their own rights. So the medical, the healthcare surrogate's gonna make the medical decisions. They're, and depending upon what's in your document, that's why I said read it, what powers do they have? Usually the healthcare surrogate, at least ours, is given Here's what they can do. They can choose whether or not we're in a facility or move the facility or rehab. So that's their control. The power of attorney then steps over, and I'm sorry if I'm stepping out of screen, steps in and can sign the contracts on behalf. So they work together. Does that make sense? Yes, you do. And that's when we talk about updating your documents. <laughs> um, and it could be, it, it depends upon what their betting head's about exactly. Um, sometimes we're able to walk families through you know, minor disagreements or misunderstandings. We unfortunately will have situations where one child, and I mean adult, child, but child, will say, we have reached a point, skilled nursing is needed. The out-of-state children, no, we could never put mom in that place. I get it, I do, but there's a difference between the one who sees them every day and the ones who don't. So we can usually, we try to counsel and say, okay, listen, this is where we're at. This is a safety issue. This isn't just, she's trying to dump somebody off. It's, mom keeps falling. That's a problem. She set the house on fire twice. Like, it is time to, to go. But so in, in that sense, we try to work with them as best as possible. Okay, I think there was another hand on the back row, and then I promise I'm moving to that side of the room. Yeah, I got it. Okay. I wasn't paying attention to the beginning. Elder law is a subspecialty of? Estate planning. Basically what it means is when you come into my office, don't go, so where's elder? The number of people that think I have a business partner named Elder is fascinating to me. And I did have one client whose daughter, her last name was Elder, and I looked at her and said, I will put you through law school if you come and partner with me. <laughs> but I don't wish law on anybody else, so there's that issue. But it's, it's basically a subspecialty of estate planning. Okay. Oh, yeah, we, we, do, we do standard estate planning for people who aren't Nearing these components, we work with young parents who have small children and need to worry about setting up pre-need guardianship for them. You know, we work everything in between. Anybody age 18 and older should have at the very least those last three documents, not the DNR, that I talked about. The power of attorney, the healthcare surrogate, and the living will. 18 and over should have that, period. Oh, I've got a pink shirt real quick and then I've got one over here if I can, sorry. Okay. No, not in Florida. No, nope. that's what we did away with was to say, now you can have a document that says that so that weird things don't pop up later, but it is not required to be incapacitated. Okay, I, there was a question over here. Yes, ma'am. Just to review again, do you quite get it, the uh, Medicaid dollars? You know, your income, so I have a personal situation that's going on right now. 
Yes, so the, um, the income limit is 2742. Yes, 2742, that goes up every year. That's why I kind of look at it and go, wait, what is it now? Because my brain has moments like that too. And then the assets are under 2,000, but again, those are countable assets. So that's not nearly as black and white a term as one would think it would be. And we didn't even touch on aid and attendance. Is anybody in here a veteran? Yeah, so I, if you guys like me enough and they have me back, then we'll, we'll chat about that in, in the future. But that's, that's an entirely different governmental entity. Mm -hmm. So Medicaid doesn't look at my trust, they look at this trust. The short answer is yes. The longer answer is we would have to look at everything and actually figure out exactly how things are owned before I could give you a solid answer on that. Yes, sir. Where, where's your office located? I'm located in Bradenton. Um, we're located uh, on 26th Street. Yeah, it's on. It's on. <laughs> I love how he chimes in there. Um, it, it's on 26th Street between 53rd and Cortez Road, but we do travel, so if it's a situation that you say, listen, we live in farther south, we can always meet somewhere or meet you at your home. Okay, Pat, you were, are you telling me to stop or you have a question? No, I'm okay. actually asking a question that we've all danced around, but I've not heard the answer for yet, and it has to do with capacity. Mm -hmm. Nice married couple, everything's going fine, and you are now suddenly dealing with symptoms that look like they might ultimately end in dementia. At one point, does that couple say, we need to start thinking about re-looking at our estate documents based on where we may be going, or if you've waited too long and you are dealing with dementia but still capacity, What's your recommendation for that kind of a scenario? No, that's an excellent question. I, I think the, the answer is it depends, um, which is the number one answer in the law. But if, if you start to see we might be headed in this direction, I think that's a good time to stop and look at things. We recommend every two to five years, look at your estate documents and make sure that's still how you want things, that's still who you want in charge. Nobody moved to Greece. You still like people. You didn't really like the cat down the street instead of your kids. I mean, things change. So I think that's a good time to, to do an initial while everybody is still predominantly, um, predominantly has capacity. If on the flip side, you either have old documents or don't have any documents, that's gonna be a case by case basis. And I can tell you right now that one of the biggest areas of, of legal litigation is in situations like that, where somebody's capacity is kind of on the line, like they have good mornings. They have terrible evenings. Do they, don't they? Because these are contractual. And so lawyers get sued. Family members get sued by other family members. You didn't have the right to do that. The, the call we got that I mentioned earlier that there was a power of attorney signed 10 days ago. Yep, red flags, left and right at that point. So hopefully in meeting with people and talking with people and potentially requiring a doctor's review, there is a difference between a medical assessment of incapacity and a legal assessment of incapacity. I am not gonna bore you with those because that we're out of time, sorry. We can do another one at some point if, if Pat wants us to, but um, in that sense, if we can still do documents, that's what we do. We try to get them done as quickly as possible. If we can't, then you're looking at guardianship, unfortunately. Any other questions? I know I've gone over and I apologize, or I'm right on time, I don't know. I keep talking until somebody kicks me out. Yes, sir. Is all this information included or is it available that you need? Well, it's available somewhere. Um, we don't have it. It's not in our booklet. The short answer is no. The slides are not in your booklet. Um, a lot of the information is, I'm looking back through them at this point. It's pardon me, not necessarily laid out the same way. A lot of mine were just to kind of show the differences. But, you know, I can get the information to Pat and have her, you know, if anybody wants a copy like of this screen or of any of the other ones, that she could get that for you. Okay? It won't be immediately. Like, I have to drive home. Sorry. And at 5 o'clock. 
So it'll be next week. Any other questions, comments, concerns? You hated me. Oh yeah, I won't say that it's intentional, but. <laughs> no problem, and in your folder there's um, these happy little things. Feel free, if you want more information, fill them out. You can leave them with the office manager back there. He's more than happy to tell you about the motorcycles. <laughs> oh, thank you. The, the irony was we, we placed a, a large order before COVID hit and because we were doing a lot of different out events and everything shipped to us and COVID hit and everything shut down and I just went. So we've had boxes. I'm like, we, we have an event. We can pass this stuff out again. So it, it, it felt so normal, which is so sad.